Okay, this is going to be part seven. The spring ingredient and disgusting spring prayer. Eventually, I woke up from my peaceful slumber. I crawled out from under Dad's cloak and stretched as hard as I could before spreading the cloak out on top of my bed. My attendants would have done this for me under normal circumstances, but I wanted to do it with my own two hands. I smoothed out the wrinkles of my palms, then carefully folded it. Okay, perfect. Fran picked up the now folded cloak, and together we headed to the dining room for breakfast. My attendants and the commoners couldn't eat before us nobles. So here in the moment, monastery, all the nobles, including the guard knights, gathered first. We naturally couldn't eat too casually when Ferdinand was here. By the time I arrived, everybody was awake and eagerly digging in. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Lady Rosemine. Bridget and Daniel appeared to have just started while Justice had clearly been forced to wake by his attendants. Ferdinand, however, was already close to being done. He must have woken up considerably earlier than anyone else. Hello, Rosemine. I see you slept well. Indeed, I was very snug last night. While Monica and Gil were preparing my meal, I had Fran call over Dad so that I could return his cloak. I had wanted to give it back myself, but the curse of nobility made me unable to do things like that. The most I could do was offer my thanks as Fran handed it to him. Gunter, I shall return your cloak. It brought me much warmth over the night, I said, as Dad knelt before me. He looked up a little, then his light brown eyes crinkled in a small, relieved smile. I am glad to have been of assistance, Lady Rosemine. From what I have heard, you will now be traveling to towns as part of spring prayer. Please take care of yourself. I thank you ever so much. You may tell the rest of your family that I wish them well, too. We are honored. Our exchange was brief, but just having the opportunity to speak to him made my heart flush with an indescribable warmth. As I watched Dad leave and return to the group of soldiers, Bridget narrowed her amethyst-colored eyes and thought, Oh, dear Lord. No, Bridget, shut up. You certainly seem close to that soldier, Lady Rosemine, she said aloud. She was the only noble out of all those present who didn't know he was my real father. Dad Ferdinand and Daniel knew, of course, while Justice and Eckert had both found out during their background check on me while it was mine. I smiled and gave Bridget the excuse that we had prepared ahead of time. Gunter has a long history with the Gilberta Company, who I have been ordering hair sticks from since before my baptism. Eva and Tuli, the two who always come to take my orders, do you remember them? I have seen them in your chambers several times before, yes. Tuli was the little girl who helped take my measurements, I believe, and I understand that you request her services often. I know that Gunter is Tuli's father. He also works closely with the husband of Karina, the woman making your dress. Prior to my baptism, Gunter would often serve as a guard when I went to the lower city on business related to the orphanage workshop. Or when the orphans went into the forest to gather. I see, Bridget replied, returning an understanding nod. Phew. The cover story was designed to make sense to anyone informed enough to be suspicious, so I was glad to see it was working so well. Rosemine, we shall be resting today. Then leave for spring prayer tomorrow, Ferdinand said, upon finishing his meal. I will come and see you later this afternoon. There is an important matter we must discuss. At that, we headed back to his room. I promptly started on my own breakfast, aware that the Gilberta Company and the soldiers were due to depart for Ehrenfest very shortly. They needed to eat as soon as possible or they would certainly be late, so I worked my way through my food as quickly as I could while still maintaining a graceful appearance. Once breakfast was done, I returned to my room so as to not get in anyone else's way. I sat in a chair and closed my eyes for a moment, only for the events of yesterday to flash through my mind once again. My mood plummeted in the blink, literal blink of an eye. Literally. You blink your eyes and then boom, your mood goes down. Lady Rosemine, the others have finished eating and are preparing to leave. Will you see them off? Fran asked, snapping me back to my senses. I gave a nod and stood up, going with him to the front gate. There we found a, new, a row of carriages, almost all of which had been packed with luggage. There was only one that was still being prepared, with priests helping the soldiers to load the remaining things. Is everything all right? I asked. Get, they asked the gathered members of the Gilberta Company, who had seemingly been discussing something among themselves. Banner took a step forward and knelt, then Mark and Lust did the same. Lady Rosemine, the Honorable Lord Ferdinand, informed us that the matter in Haas had been settled. We heard that you gave a praiseworthy performance. I could not have done it without the Gilberta Company's assistance. You have helped me out more than I could ever put into words. Thank you. They frequently gave me advice, and their connections to other merchants have been vital in our efforts to spread rumors among the commoners. They regularly visited Haas to keep us informed and manipulate things in our favor. Because of your plan, those in Haas had time to discuss matters over winter, and I am of the opinion that this proved crucial in obtaining the favorable result we secured yesterday. There surely would have been much stronger opposition to the mayor's execution had they not understood their actions, nor had the time to consider an appropriate response. I was so far removed from the common sense of nobles that it was hard to believe I could have properly directed the art scholars. 
I would surely learn more and more about how nobles did things in the future, but for now I was completely ignorant, if not for Benno and Mark. A lot more people would have been executed. I am glad to have been a service to you, Lady Rosemine. This tragedy has shown the world that we are a company whom you trust, and henceforth it shall be significantly easier for us to do business with an Aaronfest and Haas. If you ever need, have need of us again, please do not hesitate to ask, Benno intoned. I could guess that he was being sincere, but his last sentence was definitely an indirect demand that I contact him before doing anything stupid. Of course. I searched through my memories for anything that I should tell him about, then clapped my hands together in realization. Ah, yes, there's one thing I wish to say. This won't be happening immediately, but I would like to visit Ilgnir in search of new kinds of wood to use for paper. I will surely ask for your advice when the time comes, I said casually. For some reason, Benno had a vacant expression. Mark was looking at the ground and let out a heavy sigh. As I tilted my head in confusion, Benno looked at me with a smile, but his dark right eyes told a different story. Had we been in my hidden room, he would have no doubt unleashed his thunder on me right about now. Understood. I shall eagerly await your return from spring prayer, Lady Rosemine, so that I might hear the inner details of that matter. We would like to thank you for providing us new context among the nobility and discuss the dress that you have hired Karina to make, Benno said with a polite laugh. But despite his courteous tone, I knew that this was just his roundabout way of saying, Don't give me extra work when a bunch of nobles are already calling for me day in and day out, you idiot. I maintained a composed smile, but on the inside I was in a panic. No, now I don't want spring prayer to end. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> and so concluded my discussion with the Gilberta Company. While everyone got into their loaded carriages, I handed out the small silver set Benno had prepared and given to Fran ahead of time. I know the road from Haas to Ehrenfest is not an easy one with these numbers, but I am entrusting the safety of Justice and the Gilberta Company to all of you. Understood. You can count on us. The soldiers let slip eager grins as they looked at the money I had handed them. There had apparently been fierce competition back at the gate. Over who would go to Haas for guard duty, and they all seemed satisfied with their pay. I always gave Dad a large silver instead of a small one, but I had heard he was using it to buy a round of drinks for everyone, so not much would be going home with him. And by heard, I mean Tuli had told me in a letter, though her handwriting was very hard to decipher. Oh, she's still learning. Despite everyone being ready to go, there was a one person who hadn't gotten in a carriage yet, and who else would that be but Justice? This truly is a shame. If only I could accompany you during spring prayer as well, he said sadly. We were going our separate ways here since he needed to return the box of medals back to the castle as soon as possible, and since his own high beast couldn't carry it, he was traveling to the noble's quarter by carriage. His attendants were going with him, too. Justice was the only noble leaving with the soldiers, but he was deliberately delaying his return for as long as possible, looking between Ferdinand and me with clear melancholy. Ferdinand let an exasperated sigh, impatiently waving him into his carriage. Spring prayer is a religious event performed by priests. We have no need for a scholar now that the matter in Haas has been settled. You even went as far as to steal work from the one in charge of the city to come here. Are you not satisfied yet? I am satisfied with what I saw in Haas, but I wish to follow Lady Rosemine wherever I can. It seems to me that there is hardly ever a dull moment with her. <laughs> He's not wrong about that. That is simply your imagination, Ferdinand replied, now glaring at justice. Leave already. The others cannot depart until you do. Having no other choice, Justice climbed into his carriage, and with that, they were off. One by one, the carriages slowly started to move, with the soldiers walking next to them as guards. Dad served as the rear guard for the group and was there waiting at the back, so I used this opportunity to say one final goodbye. Gunter, take care on the road. And you take care of your health, Lady Rosemine, Dad responded with a grin. By then, the final carriage had started to move. He followed after it, the cloak I had slept in last night swaying behind him. And once he had completely disappeared from sight, I returned to the monastery. It was quiet now that most of the people were gone. I started to rest after lunch, and eventually Ferdinand arrived with Eckhart to talk. The only attendant you need with you here is Fran. Have the rest leave the room. Very well. Everyone but Fran, I must ask you to leave, I instructed. They all quickly did as asked, leaving him and my two guards nights. Fran poured tea for everyone, then stood by the firmly shut door. There was a long table here similar to the one in the high bishop's room and Ferdinand and I sat on opposite sides as they were facing each other. Eckert was seated beside Ferdinand while Daniel and Bridget were standing behind me on either side. First, I would like to discuss the ingredient that we shall acquire midway through spring prayer, Ferdinand began. I sensed both of my garden knights stiffen up at these words, and instinctively straightened my back. The room had gotten palpably tense. Should I take your decision to discuss this with my knights present to mean that fey beasts are going to be involved again? Given that babies tend to gather in mana at rich locations, we can assume that there will be a considerable number in the area. Justice has reported that we are likely to encounter Talfrosk. Talfrosk? Talfrosk? Whatever. Ferdinand helpfully provided a name, and while I had no idea what kind of fey beast that was, my knights seemingly did. 
A grimace flashed across Bridget's face, while that, which led me to conclude that whatever it was, it was particularly disliked by girls. Mm, please let it be anything but a bug. Oh dear. However, considering what occurred on the night of Shitsaria, it would not be wise to underestimate what could happen on the night of Flu Train. It is impossible to say whether we are going to be faced with hot babies of great size or great number. In that case, shouldn't we bring more guard knights with us? At the very least, we could have Cornelius accompany us since he's already assigned to me, I suggested. While it was important to keep my potion making a secret, Cornelius was, fam was family and someone I trusted. A Ferdinand shook his head. That is not an option. Cornelius is both a miner and an apprentice. He cannot be given work outside the city. I seem to recall him visiting Haas with us when you constructed this monastery. Am I wrong, I asked, thinking back to who rode whose high beast on the way here. At that, Ferdinand and Eckert both grimaced. Rose mind, those were abnormal circumstances, Ferdinand explained. None of us could have predicted what we were going that we were going to leave the city. That was a reasonable response. Not even I had intended for us to build the monastery in Haas straight after lunch in the Italian restaurant. So we won't be able to bring any more guard knights with us, I conceded. Is everything ready going to be okay? Fear not, Rosemine. Most fey beasts pose no threat whatsoever to Lord Ferdinand, Eckhart said reassuringly, openly facing his utmost faith in him. He even seemed excited to have the opportunity to serve as his guard knight. He probably wasn't wrong that most things wouldn't be an issue with Ferdinand around, so I decided to entrust all the security details to them and focus on the gathering itself. I took out my diptych, readied my stylus, and began asking questions. Ferdinand, what kind of material is the spring ingredient? The nectar of a ryren. Ryren? Ryren? A flower said to be beloved by the goddess herself, Ferdinand replied. We will be heading to a spring that became so rich with mana at this time of year that it was known as the goddess's bath. Flowers known as ryren bloomed there, and their nectar was this season's ingredient. The flower petals ch close during the night, and it, but it slowly produces nectar, before eventually blooming at dawn. To prevent other mana from polluting the ingredient, one must gather it at that very moment. We shall thus be leaving at night and awaiting dawn with our guard had kept high. I wrote all that down in my diptych, then looked up at Ferdinand. Have you ever been to the spring? I would assume so. No, actually, he probably might not have, considering he probably got his ingredients around the Royal Academy. No, I went gathering quite regularly while attending the Royal Academy, but since graduating and returning to Arenfest, I have not had such leisure. Ferdinand explained, I am familiar with vile and dangerous babies that must be hunted by the Knight's Order, but I am not particularly well informed on harmless fey beasts and all the materials available here. As a result, we are largely reliant on Justice's information when it comes to gathering an air infest. There was no doubting that Justice was an absolute weirdo, but he was truly knowledgeable about all manners of subjects. What's more, since he readily went to gather materials himself, the information he provided could be trusted. I shall prepare the tools you need for gathering and lend them to you again when the time comes. I thank you ever so much. Once we have finished talking about the ne Ryrain Nectar, and just as this previous encounter with the Tau Frost, Ferdinand ordered Fran and the Guard Knights to leave the room. I now wish to be alone with Rosemite so that I might discuss matters in Haas. Everyone, clear the room. Uh oh. Is he gonna scold her? Yes, sir. Fran poured us fresh cups of tea and then exited with Daniel and Bridget following close behind. Edgar seemed to want to stay and continue doing his duty as a guard, but he too was forced to leave. Ferdinand sipped his freshly poured tea and set the cup down, and then looked at me steadily with his light golden eyes. Us facing each other alone like this always meant the start of a lecture of some or some kind of scolding. I know. That's why I thought he might be scolding her. I placed my hands on my lap and straightened my back. Rosemont, I would like you to tell me what you have learned from your experience with Oz. I closed my eyes for a moment, and images from yesterday immediately flashed to my mind. When I opened them again, I clenched my fist, looking at Ferdinand head on, and doing my best to not get emotional. First... I'm now painfully aware that I need to grasp, fully grasp noble culture as soon as possible. The problem in Haas had stemmed from my ignorance in three crucial areas. The cultural importance of ivory buildings, the contrast in what no commoners and nobles deemed common sense, and the hospitality that nobles were supposed to be given. In order to prevent something similar from happening again, I needed to master noble culture as soon as possible. Correct. Were you a noble, normal noble child, you could slowly learn about our culture and customs beneath the protection of your parents. But in order to run your workshop and spread printing throughout the duchy, you have already leaped into the world of adults. Okay, that is the right page. There was a lie I needed to learn, and I needed to do it as quickly as possible, since I was doing things no other child could ever do. I was no longer a commoner. I needed guidance, not as a merchant, but as a noble. Nobles will be unmoved by the logic of a commoner merchant. All you have done so far is establish an orphanage and a workshop in Haas. 
You acted on impulse without preparation, and the only reason it ended without any major incident was because the enemies you made were commoners living within the Archduke's central district. As far as I'm concerned, this was a mass, uh, major incident. I protested impetuously. What would you call an execution that had resulted in six deaths if not a major incident? That's a minor, considering he could have killed the entire city. Ferdinand let out a dismissive laugh. That happened because of your insistence on saving Haas and keeping it on the map. Under normal circumstances, the entire city would have been erased, saving much time and leaving fewer problematic loose ends. What? No way, that would definitely cause more problems. Another disagreement born from our different values, I see. To me, it was much more time-consuming and tedious to save Haas than to destroy it. The point we disagreed on most was the value of a human life. The gap between commoners and the nobility was just unfathomably vast. I slowly shook my head. I understand that my culture doesn't mesh well with this world, but I will never get used to taking the lives of others so easily. You do have a commoner family, I suppose. It will be tough for you to fully adopt a noble's way of thinking, but do your best to absorb as much as you can. Oh, well, not only that, but she has her freaking values from Japan, dude. Do you not remember that? Her values are completely different than yours. Ever think to maybe ask her about her culture and what it was like? Maybe then you might get some understanding as to why she's like this? Sorry, I was taking a drink of my tea. I didn't mind working to learn something when I had willing teachers there to explain it to me, but there was a big difference between understanding something and believing it. My mindset would be firmly rooted in my Iran upbringing no matter what happened, so overriding it completely would be almost impossible. I can master day-to-day -day culture by watching others and copying what I see, but changing the very way I think about things is another matter entirely. There's a fundamental part of me that makes my thought process unlike anyone else's in this world, but I don't know how out of place I really am. It won't be easy for me to force myself to become like a regular noble. Regardless, if you intend to continue spreading the printing industry in the, as the Archduke's adopted daughter, you are inevitably going to be dealing with nobles. If you do not grasp the culture, then problems will occur with consequences far more severe than what you saw in Haas. Not everything can be solved solely by relying on the Archduke's authority. The incident in Haas had seriously blown up in my face, and that was just a problem with commoners. Doing something that attracted the IRF nobles would lead to something even worse. So I needed to process caref proceed carefully, making sure to consider every action I took. I need to start using uh, indirect euphemisms so I can't be held to my exact words, and I need to advance things carefully so that no unexpected problems occur. Does that mean I need to work on my impatience, my impatience before anything else, I asked? Yes. Fran Ferdinand grimaced, grinned and gave me a nod. I had given him the exact answer he wanted. I cannot emphasize whatsoever with your lust for books and the blindness they instill in you. But I do understand that you desire them above all else. It is important that you understand that there are likely no others who value books as much as you do. If you wish to spread the printing industry, you will need to learn patience and cease forcing things ahead at an unnatural pace. You can blame Sylvester on that one. He was the one who wanted you to do printing in three months. In other words, he was telling me not to spread the industry any further until the people wanted it. Perhaps it would be best for me to focus on business and the improvement of printing technology while spreading, operating my current workshops at maximum capacity. In that case, I will slow my expansion to a gentle pace that won't invite any opposition and use that time to improve paper and the overall literacy rate. Yeah, improve the literacy rate and once people start wanting books, then start moving the printing forward. Once I no longer needed to ded dedicate my energy to educating the noble children, I wanted to improve the education of commoners as well. That would mean more customers for my books. But my but grand plan was halted almost immediately by Ferdinand, who frustratedly raised a hand. Stop. What exactly are you talking about? Hmm? I'm just thinking about working on the quality before quantity. And I thought you were finally beginning to understand. Where is all this coming from, Ferdinand asked, now cradling his head way weird. Why is he reacting like that? I'm guessing another difference? Um, well, if you thought I was finally beginning to understand a moment ago, let's rewind the conversation back to what happened in Haas. This time, I don't intend to understand, underestimate the cultural dis dissimilarity, dissimilarities between commoners and nobles. In particular, I think it's important to teach mayors and town chiefs exactly how nobles think. To what end? Because if they're going to deal with nobles, then they'll need to know how to act better so they don't end up making a stupid mistake and doing the same thing that the mayor did. You know? 
To what end, Ferdinand asked, not comprehending why this was necessary, but it seemed clear to me that the commoners in a position where they needed to deal with nobles would benefit from learning their culture. Haas's mayor ultimately ordered the attack because he was convinced that any transgressions would be forgiven so long as he offered money, women, and wine to whoever, whichever priest or noble took issue with him. Due to the influence that Bezin Watts had on the central district while he was alive, I am certain that the other mayors hold the same misconception. It would be better to teach them now that their bribes are no longer acceptable. Ferdinand responded with a blatant grimace. You intend for me to explain these simple matters to every single mayor? Well, I'm just a little kid on the outside, but the adults don't invite me to their nighttime discussions. Hello? Not only were there no opportunities for me to speak to them, but I wasn't sure how seriously they would take the advice of a kid. Meanwhile, you only had to take a look at Ferdinand to know he was a serious man who wouldn't joke around. One word from him and they would no doubt carve his warnings deep into their hearts. Why don't you just have them all gathered in the same place and tell them all at once? You know? But sadly, Ferdinand shook his head. Is it not obvious to them that people must be accommodated differently? Why must I waste my time educating fools so helpless that they would lead themselves to their own demise? All you'd need to do is speak to them for a little while when we pass through their cities during spring prayer and the harvest festival. I think you'll find it much more tedious and time-consuming to run around inviting problems, destroying cities, and executing people than to take some time to educate them. Education's key here. Knowledge is power. Ferdinand drummed his fingers on the table. I see. You do have a point. If you insist on educating them, I shall permit you to do it yourself. We will not be spending the night at every city, however, so that will not provide the full coverage that you seek. As the, how, instead, as the High Bishop, you will need to discuss this with them prior to performing your spring prayer duties. Do not attempt to push this tedious busy work on me. Fine. The next day, at both winter mansions we visited for spring prayer, I faced the mayor and town chiefs who came to greet me and explained what had happened in Haas. I made sure to put up my saint facade and frame my concerns as worry for their safety, saying things like, I'm certain nobody here would do something similar, but I worry how far the former high bishop's influence may have spread. Given the number of mayors who began to avert their gazes midway through my explanation, I could guess that my efforts had saved us at least a little trouble. Ooh, here we go. We're going to go get the spring ingredient, the goddess's bath. It turns out that Bezimwas only ever visited the cities close to Arambes, sticking to a limited area within the already relatively small central district. The moment we reached a particular distance away from Arambes, the attitudes of the mayors and town chiefs changed considerably. Is this something that's hard to notice from the Archduke's perspective, I asked. Bezimwas was the high bishop for a considerably long time thanks to Veronica's influence, and he always selected tax officials who could carry out his whims. The reality was, he had more leverage in Arenfest than a lay noble scholar. I can imagine his relationships to commoners were given no scrutiny as long as the taxes were collected, in full from each city. At that, Ferdinand paused before continuing with a bitter smile. Even my late father was weak to Veronica, due in no small part to him taking me in. This all happened many years before Sylvester became on Arenfest. Sylvester lacked the strength and a good enough cause to remove his own mother and uncle from power, a latter of whom had served as high bishop for decades. In any case, being a noble in the height of tedium is the height of tedium. All just actions will encounter fierce resistance. To see actual results, you must accumulate power and thoroughly set the stage over an extensive period of time. Attempting to act against injustice the moment you see it runs the significant risk of causing more problems elsewhere. You must learn to sit back and observe the situation, even if you find what is occurring deplorable. Exactly, just like what happened with the orphanage. He wanted to do something about it, but he wasn't able to do so because of what was going on at the time. I nodded, but deep down, I couldn't imagine myself managing to silently overlook something I found deplorable. Ferdinand must have picked up on that as he shot me a glare. Do, you not, do not nod if you do not understand. I'll do my best to learn to overlook things if they don't involve books or my own family, I conceded, which only made Ferdinand massage his temples and grimace even harder. In any case, I would need to be careful. I knew that the moment I got wrapped up in something, I wouldn't be able to control myself. My attempts to educate the mayors and town chiefs aside, spring prayer was largely the same as last year, and we consequently went through it without much issue. There were, however, a few things that stood out. For one, my blessings last year had made such an impact on the harvest that every winter mansion we visited met us with enthusiastic fervor. They spoke to us with heated expression, no doubt hoping for an even more bountiful harvest this year, since I was now the high bishop and not just an apprentice shrine maiden. In addition to that, our journey this year was a lot more leisurely. Our potion field death march was a thing of the past. 
We would arrive at our first winter mansion of the day in the morning and perform spring prayer, then speak to the local authorities over lunch. Then in the afternoon, we would travel to the second winter mansion. Here we would perform again, have dinner with the authorities, and then go to bed. We repeated this process over and over every single day. It was fairly tiring since we had every meal with city and town authorities, which meant I always needed to be watching my words. I was here as the Archduke's adopted daughter and the High Bishop, so I needed to act the part. The sole silver lining was that I could use my youth as an excuse to retire to my room straight after each meal. Ferdinand, on the other hand, was not so lucky. Ha ha. Ha 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 It wasn't long before I had mastered my excuse. I would love to spend more time speaking with you all, but I must leave so that I might provide blessings to as much land as possible. I would say with a saintly smile whenever they tried to keep me at the table. Each morning, our attendants would climb into their carriage and head to the winter mansion we planned to stay at the night in. Meanwhile, I traveled by high beast. Fran and Zom rode with me since they served my, served my lunch and because they had been entrusted with managing the divine instrument. For lunch, our personal chefs, in my case Ella, prepared meals for us. This was standard practice, apparently done to avoid us having to test for poison and to reduce the burden on cities that were low on food after the winter. The real reason, however, was that Ferdinand was adamant about not about only wanting to eat food that he liked. He was able to endure common food every now and again, but he didn't want to eat it day after day. In all honesty, I had to agree. I would much rather have food than I enjoyed. As we continued our spring prayer journey, we traded grain from the temple for wild spring vegetables that grew near farming towns, including some that resembled slightly hard lettuce. This is the town closest to the goddess bath, Ferdinand said, as we arrived in Fontdorf. Once we had completed our spring prayer duties, we were invited to dinner with the town authorities, as per usual. The town chief spoke to us about the spring while I ate. Ah, the goddess's bath. The water there has the power to heal minor injuries and illnesses. There are no travelers there at the, at the present due to the snow still covering the mountains, but in the summer, people come from far and wide to acquire its water. So the water has special power, said I asked. Is it a spl- spring of Flutrain, the goddess of water, or Hilschmir, the goddess of healing? It is said to be where all the goddesses of spring gather, though nobody has actually seen one there before. Well, I would assume not, considering uh, the goddesses. You don't want to see the freaking deities there. You'd freak out. The town chief replied, smiling like a kindly old grandpa teaching his curious grandchild. I am very much looking forward to the night of flu train now. Ah, uh, could it be that you need to reach the spring by then? If so, I am sorry to say that you may not make it in time. It may be nearby, but there are mountains you must travel through, the town chief stammered, glancing uneasily between Ferdinand and me. I mean, it wouldn't be that big of a deal to get there via high beast, to be honest. Now, if they were going there on foot, then heck yes, they wouldn't be able to get there in time. The spring, known as the goddess's bath, was located on a shortish mountain surrounded by forests some distance away from any human settlement. And due to all the snow, it would take several days to reach it by carriage. The town chief asserted that we wouldn't be able to make it no matter how hard we tried. But Ferdinand simply shook his head. Fear not. We will travel. We shall travel by high beast, making the snow and distance irrelevant. Ah, uh, yes, I see. Flying high beast certainly would allow you to avoid these problems. The town chief sighed in relief, as did many others. There was one who crossed their arms with a worried expression, however. A tall frost at the spring here most likely accumulated a lot of power by now. I imagine that you will be safe with your accompanying knights, but please do take care. I thank you for your concerns. As the Tau Frosks never stayed far from the spring and thus posed no threat to the local towns, it seemed they were largely left alone. That in turn meant that they grew fairly large, so we would need to stay on guard when we arrived. While it should not take us long to reach the spring, it would be ideal for us to exterminate the Tau Frost while it is still bright. As such, we shall depart well ahead of time, Ferdinand mused aloud. And so it was decided that we would set up camp in the forest, hunting the Tau Frosks and other local Fabies while we were there. We were just about to start hunting the harmful Fabies ourselves to ensure the safety of our farms, so it would be an enormous help if we exterminated those in the forest for us, one town chief said, his eyes wrinkling in a grateful smile. While the forest was rich with food, the smaller Fabies thriving there would apparently start invading the farming towns once they began growing crops. Farmers could hunt the smaller fa- ones not dangerous enough to demand the order's help themselves, but doing this alongside their usual labor would be extremely strenuous. You may consider it payment for your information, Ferdinand said, at which point one of the grateful old men clapped his hands together. Then allow me to tell you one more thing. You will do well to bring sweets to the goddess's bath. Sweets? I asked, tilting my head. You may not need any if you are traveling by high beast, but it seems that the goddess of the spring has quite a fondness for sweets such as honey, milk, and fruit. Leaving such an offering by the statue at the entrance to the forest will allow me to re- allow one to reach the spring without getting lost. 
Oh, I see. In that case, I will certainly prepare sweets, I said. I thank you ever so much for your valuable information. We lived in a world where building up mana and asking the gods for help resulted in actual magic. If an offering would make our path easier, then it would be wise for us to bring plenty of sweets. I shall leave the sweets preparation to you, Rosemine. Be ready to depart tomorrow. We will be leaving the majority of our tenants in, Fontr in Fontadorf, instead heading to the goddess' bath for an elite strike team. The knights could look after themselves, and this needed, needed no attendance, but I will be bringing mine, since my high beast had the capacity for it. In total, I will be bringing Fran, Monica, Nicola, Ella, and Rosina. Why would you be bringing them with you to the goddess's bath? Ferdinand has suggested that I bring a chef so that we could eat better food, and I was sure that Monica and Nicola would provide a useful assistance in this regard. Rosina, on the other hand, was accompanying us at her own request, having said that she didn't want to be left alone. I had thus ended up bringing her along, too, under the agreement that she would help out with my any attendant work that wouldn't risk damaging her fingers. I returned to my room with Fran, who had served my food. Monica, Nicola, begin preparations for spending the next few days in the forest. Inform Ella and Rosina the same. You mean the food, water, clothes, medicine, and so on that we'll need while staying at the goddess's bath, Monica asked to confirm? Fran nodded in response, then turned to me. Lady Rosemine, you may leave the preparations to us. The high priest has informed us of what we need. All the luggage will be put into my high base, so be sure to include food for the knights, I instructed, looking over my attendants before resting my eyes on Nicola. Nicola, inform Ella to prepare sweets as well. Honey or jam should do. Out of everyone here, Nicola was the most enthusiastic about food. I had no worries about leaving this responsibility to her. She always helped Ella with a smile and was closer to her than anyone. The sweets are for offerings to a goddess. It seems that such an offering will allow us to reach the spring without losing our way, I explained. Nicola beamed with excitement. Lady Rosemary, we shall prepare some of your special sweets as well, not just honey. I am certain that the goddess would be even more overjoyed if we offered confection she has never had before. That is a point! That is a good point! That might be true. She might even get to meet the goddess if she likes it enough. <laughs> That'll be fun to see. Very true. You may tell that to Ella as well. Okay, Nicola exclaimed, her reddish orange hair bobbing up and down as she nodded. She then paused for a moment, carefully meeting my gaze. Lady Rosemine, would you like us to also prepare sweets that I won't be offered to the goddess? Certainly, we can all eat them together when we reach the spring. Okay. Since cookies were easy to eat, Ella opted to bake some as her sweets. Well, I suppose she was cooking rather than baking them, there was no oven available, so she had instead used a frying pan. They ended up looking like bite-sized pancakes as a result, but a quick taste test confirmed that this was an issue. We finished the last of our preparations in the morning and ate lunch, then headed to the goddess's back by high beast, leaving behind everyone's attendants ex except mine. Together we soared through the sky, tracing thin roads laced between farms on our way to the forest. It took some time, which was to be expected since the spring was several days away by carriage, but we managed to arrive at the entrance of the forest before Fifth Bell. Snow still coated the small mountain from its peak down to about mid the midway point, while the base signaled the coming of spring with a plethora of greenery. We landed at the entrance to the woods, at which point Ferdinand started giving instructions to the Garden Knight. Eckert, Daniel, search for the spring from above. Bridget, stay here with Rosemine. At that, Ferdinand, Eckert, and Daniel got onto their high beasts and returned to the skies. Those of us left behind got out of my panda bus and stretched, taking in the chilly air. While it was absolutely more comfortable than riding in a carriage, driving it for such a long time still tired me out. As we continued to stretch, Monica pointed toward the forest. Ah, Lady Rosemine, is that not the statue we should offer our sweets to? I looked over to see the statue of a goddess sitting right beside the road leading into the forest, covered in dirt and vegetation from having been abandoned over the winter. It was easy to guess that it had been there for many, many years. The finer details of the face and clothes had worn away so that even while looking with squinted eyes, I couldn't tell which goddess it was meant to represent. Lady Rosemite, shall we clean it? I cannot stand to see a goddess look so filthy. My attendants still fur all furled their brows. They had been raised in the temple, surrounded by near spotless effigies, effigies of the gods their entire lives, so it was no doubt hard for them to overlook what they were seeing. Feel free to brush away the vegetation and clean it a little, but you'll have to hurry. There isn't much time before Ferdinand and the others will return. Fran, Monica, and Nicola got to work at once, speedily cleaning the statue. They brushed away the dead leaves and plants before using a dry rag to scrub where we could. We were replacing our offerings. That alone made the statue look significantly better than it had a second ago. Ella, prepare the offerings, if you will. Ella took at honey, milk, dried fruit, and cookies from the large box that she was cradling and gave them to Nicola, who in turn brought them over to me. I delicately placed the sweets and some nearby renfrols, white flowers that marked the beginning of spring, onto the base of the statue. May we safely reach the goddess's bath, I prayed, clasping my hands together. It was a habit that my many years of earth and earth had deeply ingrained into me, 
and it was only when I noticed the confused, uncomfortable looks that everyone was giving me that I hurriedly corrected myself. Praise be to the gods, I declared, raising one leg and throwing my hands into the air like I was praising the sun. My attendants did the same behind me. Once we had completed our prayer, we hurried back to my, into my high beast while the spring flowers had started to bloom. It was still incredibly cold outside. We all waited for Ferdinand and the others while eating the dried fruit that we had kept in Lessie. We have returned, Ferdinand announced, upon his eventual return, his high beast being the first to, to land. I hurriedly wiped my hands and climbed out of my panda bus to greet them. Welcome back, everyone. Did you find the goddess's bath? Unfortunately, it cannot be seen from above. There were unnaturally few gaps between the trees or rivers. We can conclude that Mana is obfuscating the area, preventing the spring from being reached from above. Justice said they had found it quite easily from the sky when he visited during the summer, so it might be that now is a special time with a greater amount of Mana accumulating as the Nidaflu train draws near. The abundance of mana, like what we had seen during the night of Shisaria, meant that the information Justice had acquired in advance wouldn't be particularly useful. Ferdinand always prepared for things well ahead of time, so I could guess that he wasn't fond of unexpected developments like this. He crossed his arms as if on guard and began scanning the area, his gaze eventually falling on the goddess statue. I suppose this is the only entrance to the forest. I looked around the statue as well and gave a big nod simultaneously confirming that our offerings were still there. It'll be fine. We cleaned the statue, provided our offerings, and then prayed to the goddess so we would reach the spring without any issue. Your optimism astounds me, but very well. I should take the lead. Bridget and Daniel stick with Rosemine and stay behind me. Eckert, bring up the rear. Follow me. Ferdinand urged his high beast forward into the forest, his extended wings folded as it floated slightly above the ground. Bridget rode hers behind him while I followed her cape and Leslie, making him also float slightly. See, I'm competent. I can do those things too when I set my mind to it. We hadn't been able to see it from the entrance, but a little further inside, there was plenty of snow that hadn't melted yet. It was also pretty dark, maybe due to the rows of tall trees that were blocking out the light. Damiel, Azants, Eckert suddenly shouted, I'm on it. Damiel replied, rushing forward on his high beast to hunt the cat like fey beast. He came back in no time at all, only to be lectured by Eckert on needing to improve his aim so that he could seize the foot face stone in a single blow. Damiel, there's an F Ifnet. I Ifnet. Whatever. Go. This baby looked similar to a squirrel and was about as large as a cat. It had two short, short horns protruding from its head and moved fairly nimbly, landing from branch to branch as Daniel chased after it. We waited in place until he had retrieved the face stone. I see that Daniel is still rather slow, Ferdinand observed. Perhaps his limited amount of mana has caused him to rely on fighting without it. It appears that he requires further training in mana-based combat as well as standard physical improvements, Edgar replied. Ferdinand and him musing on the best way to train Daniel as they watched his movements. It seemed that he was still young enough for the Knights nice Order to take an interest in honing his talents. The Fey Beasts that appeared before us were small in size and number, so they were hunted fairly quickly. Daniel fought alone, working up a sweat for our sake, until we eventually reached a small clearing that seemed like a camp be a campsite of sorts. We passed through it, heading for the spring deeper inside the forest. What direction shall we be heading in? Ferdinand asked aloud, looking around. We had passed through several campsites while hunting Fey Beasts, but the road had slowly disappeared from beneath the snow. Stopping us from advancing any further, I took a page from Ferdinand's book and looked around as well. We were surrounded by trees as we had been since we entered, but there was one spot where I noticed a sliver of light peeking through. Ferdinand, what about there? I see some light between the trees. Where? Over here, I replied. As I moved Leslie closer to the light, the trees themselves moved aside to make a path for me. Whoa. I blinked in surprise, having not expected that at all, then looked at Ferdinand. Did that happen because of our offerings? Perhaps, that, but that might not be the only reason, Ferdinand murmured with a bitter expression before advancing his high beast down the opening path. Bridget followed me close behind. Our surroundings became gradually brighter as we progressed along the thin, curved path. Until eventually, the trees fell away completely. The murky forest had opened into a clearing with the sun shining brightly above us. Is this the goddess's bath? It's beautiful. To my surprise, the clearing felt like it had jumped from the tall end, tail end of winter to the middle of spring, time-wise. Clear water sprung forth as the beaming sun shone high, bright that light up down upon it. An unthinkable sight considering that we had just come from a road so covered in snow that we couldn't even see it. Surrounding the spring were groups of white rain furls, and birds could be heard chirping overhead. A gentle wind stroked the water's surface which gleam, gleamed as more fresh water bubbled forth and flowed further down. At the center of the bluish green spring were pale pink flowers which looked exactly like water lilies at first glance. Those are Ryrens, the flowers supposedly loved by the goddess herself, and will be gathering their nectar? Correct. But we shall advance no further today. I sense hot fey beasts nearby. Likely the tall frost, and we have far too many... No. 
Too many non-combat personnel with us. We shall return to camp for now, Ferdinand said. This time we traveled in the opposite order, heading back to the last campsite we had passed. Now even the snowy clearing felt somewhat dark and gloomy when compared to the dazzling spring. Rosemind stepped back. Bridget and I did as instructed, moving back to the trees at which point Ferdinand and Eckert each flicked something into the midst of the clearing. In an instant, the snow began to melt before our eyes. I watched on in a daze, at which point Ferdinand drew his high beast close to me. Place this magic tool inside your high beast. It will allow the creature to remain without your presence. Ferdinand said, and he was right. I stepped out of my pan to bust, leaving the magic tool inside so that it wouldn't disappear when I moved far away. The air was exceptionally cold, like tiny daggers stabbing into my skin, maybe due to the nearby snow or the tall trees blocking the sun. Attendants begin preparing food. We shall go forth and hunt the Tau Frosts. Rosemind, ride with Bridget, and stay alert. I shall teach you how to gather the rye, rye rain nectar once the hunt is over. Once Ferdinand had given everyone a job to do, I checked to make sure that I had the gathering kit he had lent me, then climbed onto Bridget's high beast. Now then, everyone, I entrust the food to you all. Be careful, my lady. We await your safe return. Really? Oh my god. Uh, I'm continuing. It's only 40 minutes. The night of flu train. Once I was in Bridget's high beast, we began heading back to the goddess's bath, following the sharply curving path created for us by the trees. Ferdinand raced ahead on his own high beast, and the surface of the sunlit, sunlit spring began to swell upward upon his arrival. Talfrost, Rosemine, your blessing. Ferdinand shouted from above. Or from up ahead. I immediately poured Mana into my ring, accustomed to the process since I had prayed for Angriff's blessing many times before. O God of War Angriff, of the God of Fire Laden Shafts Exalted Twelve, I pray that you grant them your divine protection. At that, a blue light flew out of my ring before raining down upon everyone. I was anything but a fighter and held everyone else back with my lack of stamina, so blessings were the most I could do to help out in the combat. Daniel, Bridget, stay by Rosemine. Eckert, follow me. Sir. A large shadow formed in the center of the spring. From it, three, note, four small shadow, smaller shadows burst forward, leaping out of the water. A tail frost turned out to be toads, about as wide as an adult, spreading their arms out as wide as they could. While they sounded pretty big, it was almost nothing compared to the ghosts that we'd fought during the autumn, or the, sh or the schneesturm that had become the lord of winter. Where the tail frost did excel, however, was in how disgusting they looked. Why am I always up against toads, I asked with a sigh. Daniel and Bridget both looked at me in confusion, having not understood. What do you mean, they asked. A toads are creatures that look a lot like Talfrosks. You'll understand what I mean, right, Daniel? These Talfrosks remind you of Count Findewald, don't they? And the similarities don't stop there. They're even about to be exterminated by Ferdinand. Daniel burst into laughter before quickly facing forward in an attempt to hide his amusement. His armor let out a small clank as he moved to cover his mouth, but the fact that his body was still shaking made it pretty obvious that I had really tickled his funny bone. <laughs> yeah, he did. Bridget hadn't seen Count Bindewald herself, so she hadn't, didn't have the same reaction. A man who looks like a Talfrost, I would very much like to keep my distance from him. But going to combine, came Eckert's voice. I turned around to see the largest Talfrost flick out its tongue, wrapping it around a nearby, a smaller, nearby smaller Talfrost before pulling it into his mouth. No sooner had it swallowed than it began to rapidly grow in, in size, flicking its tongue, firing its tongue at the remaining Talfrost one by one. Oh, crap. There is no need to be afraid, Lady Rose. My mere Talfrost pose no threat to us, Bridget said. They are simply gross and nothing more. It was clear that she disliked Talfrost and found them disgusting, a sentiment I agreed with entirely. This left, the left arm she kept wrapped around me for protection was even more tense than usual. Fernand and Eckhart turned her, their staffs into swords, Fill, uh, file, filling them with mana as they glared up at the still growing Talfrost. Then they set their sights on the creature's belly, which continued to swell its size as it swallowed more and more of its companions before raising their weapons to attack. The Talfrost's long tongue whipped out with blistering speed, wrapping itself around Bridget's high beast in an instant. Before I could even process what had happened, we were bearing dragged through the air toward its mouth. What? I noticed Bridget trying to whip out her stat, probably to change it into a weapon, but we were yanked into the Talfrost's wide open maw before she could. The creature then closed its mouth, its tongue still wrapped around us, leaving us stranded in a pitch-black, uncomfortably warm, and foul-smelling cave. Oh no, you guys just got eaten! Bridget took this moment to turn her high beast back into a face bone, freeing us from the tongue. She then transformed her staff into a long halberd like the one she had used before. Perhaps due to the mana increase inside, it shone a little in the darkness. Lady Rosemont, are you okay? Bridget asked, stabbing her halberd into the roof of the Talfrost's mouth to stop it from swallowing us. I was doing fine since she had been holding on to me the entire time, though. Due to have her having softened her armor, I had nearly, very nearly suffocated in her small chest, in her soft chest. I'm okay. It's very wet and sticky in here, though. 
In that case, would you be so kind as to fill your gathering knife with mana and stab its tongue? Bridget asked, keeping her right hand firmly under Halbert as she crouched down with me in her left arm. She was setting me down onto the tongue, but she wasn't about to let go of me. We both grimaced at the soft springiness beneath our feet. Okay, I said, taking out my knife and pouring mana into it as instructed. I'll do it. I could feel Bridget tightening her grip around me, determined to protect me no matter what. Once the knife was full, I stabbed it into the Talfrost tongue as hard as I could. What? Nothing happened. The Talfrost didn't shriek, nor did it open its mouth. I broke out into a cold sweat, surprised by the complete lack of reaction. I nervously refilled my knife with mana, stabbing the tongue over and over again. Ha <laughs> ha! God dang it! Suddenly, a bright light pierced the darkness, causing me to instinctively close my mouth, eyes. My legs trembled, my body suddenly tilted diagonally, at which point I lost my balance with the knife still in hand. I rolled down the Bridget, who tightened her grip around my stomach before leaping toward the light. By the time I realized that the light staving in was from the towel frost opening its mouth, I was already soaring through the air in Bridget's arms, having been flung out of the thing's mouth. I could hear all sorts of sounds again. The stench disappeared as clean air washed over me, accompanied by the sting of cold wind brushing my skin. Go straight into the spring, Ferdinand roared. In response, Bridget directed her speedy freefall into the spring water. I'd shut my eyes tightly, desperately clinging to her as I braced for a hard impact. We landed in the spring with an enormous crashing sound, but the landing was surprisingly soft. I didn't feel any pain or even any resistance. It was as though the water had simply accepted us in. It was strange. At this time of year, the spring was supposed to be full of freezing water from the melting snow. Water cold enough to stop one's heart if they jumped in unprepared, but this water was neither hot nor cold. In fact, I could breathe just fine, too. And when I opened my eyes, I could see it so clearly through the stirring water that even the air bubbles coming from my own mouth were visible. There was a large shadow blotting out the sun above and two balls of radiant light racing toward it. I could guess that these were attacks launched by Ferdinand and Eckert. They smashed into the towel frost, sending it soaring high into the sky where it exploded. Bridget and I quickly rose to the surface, gasping for air the moment our heads were above the water. By that time, the reverberations from the attack had started to settle down. It's over, I sighed, sighing with relief. Bridget looked up at the sky and gave a sharp warning. No, here they come, she explained, her voice tense as she readied her staff. When I looked up myself, I saw dark blobs coming down overhead. I squinted, thinking they were maybe the exploded guts of the top frost, only to make eye contact with one of the many, many falling frogs. Heep! Frogs, or tail frosts, rather, of all sizes, rained down from the sky, ranging from as big as my thumb to the size of an adult fist. Some landed on my head, face, and shoulder, attacking me, sticking to me in an instant. A shudder ran down my spine the second I felt one of their dark, damp, slick bodies wriggling on my cheek. Ah, get them off! Get them off! Get them off! Rose might cease your screaming. Peel them off and kill them with your knife. Otherwise, they will combine, Ferdinand said, aim sternly, mercilessly abandoning me to focus on crushing the tail frost around him. Eckert was busy doing the same. As it turned out, Tau Frost simply split into the smaller versions of themselves when hurt. And what made them exceptionally annoying was that you could only kill them when they were about as small as they could get. Bridget sim similarly had her hands full with the Tau Frost around her. Once I understood that no one was coming to help me, I tried to get the Tau Frost off myself, shaking my head while flooding my arms and legs, but they clung to me as much as they could. The slimy things moving on my face destroyed the last ounce of consideration I had toward acting refined and graceful. I immediately dropped the facade and wailed in desperation. No, 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 I can't do this. Someone please at least get the one off my nose. <laughs> it wasn't bad for her. Come to me, Lady Rosemine. I will remove them for you. Daniel, you are the most heroic person I've ever met. Daniel flew over, picked me up my flailing body up out of the water, and set me down onto his high beast. Once he had pulled the towel frost off me, I wiped away my snot and tears. I hate this. I'm never coming to this spring again. You fool, Ferdinand barked out, instantly shooting me a cold glare. We are hunting these tail frosts so that we might gather the nectar tomorrow at dawn, so you will be coming here again. In any case, the tail frost has been defeated. You shall now be able to gather safely tomorrow. Are you really sure about that? Enough. Tonight is the night of flu train. Get in bed at early and prepare for dawn tomorrow. Upon arriving at, back at camp, I immediately closed Leslie's window so that Monica and Nicola could help me change out of sight. Even a healthy person could come, become deathly ill from falling into a spring at this time of year. Lady Rosemine, you are far from healthy, Monica said. How are you feeling? What did the high priest say? You won't be able to go gathering tomorrow if you catch a fever. Please take care, Nicola added, both of them lecturing me as they peeled off my wet clothes and wiped me with a towel that had dipped in warm, they had dipped in warm water. Bridget was changing as well. Your high beast certainly is splendid, Lady Rosemine. Ever never would have been able to comfortably change clothes while camping on a long-distance mission like this. Apparently, if not for my panda bush, she would have been forced to change in the snow spreading her cape across a tree branch to serve as a makeshift curtain. In my opinion, that wasn't something a noble lady should ever have to do, even if she was only removing her face stone armor. 
That said, according to Bridget, minors weren't given missions that required them to leave the nobles' quarter, and since adult women married fairly quickly, it was rare for female knights to go on hunts or gathering missions deep in the wilderness. Ferdinand gave me instructions on how to gather the nectar as we ate the food my attendants had prepared for us. All I needed to do was move it from the center of the flowers into bottles, but it was very, he was very firm that I had to do so using the metal spoon he had given me. The spoon is made such that it will not pollute the mana. Use it when scooping the nectar into the bottles no matter what. The royal flowers and fruits scattered on the knife should sorry, it held properties entirely unlike the same flowers and fruits gathered from during other seasons, and the same may be true for the rye rain nectar gathered tonight, Ferdinand said, wearing the expression of a mad scientist. I wasn't really all that pleased that he was getting the time to indulge in his own hobbies, though this was probably because I still wasn't given much reading time. Call me selfish all you want. I strongly believe that Ferdinand wasn't being fair. Maybe. But I'm sure that he has to do this. Ensure that you put nectar in into each bottle. I wish to experiment with the nectar that has your mana and the nectar that doesn't. I didn't really mind Ferdinand using the materials for his own research, but I was starting to think that his ultimate goal here wasn't actually to help gather ingredients from my derive, but maybe that was just me. He is. He just wants to get, experiment with the rest of it. <clears throat> Once we had all finished our food, we went to bed early. I reclined the driver's seat of my panda bus so that I would have room to stretch my legs, and Ferdinand shook his head with exasperation upon seeing all the blankets that my attendants had spread out. Your high beast is unnatural and bizarre. I prefer the term convenient. Just be glad I didn't make him into an RV. Good grief. In any case, it is sizable. All the women here may choose to sleep in it. Fran, come with me. And so Ferdinand decreed that Leslie would be a sleeping place for all the girls in our group. Bridget got inside and Fran lo left looking a little relieved to not be stuck in the girl-filled high bus. High beast. Yeah, it's a good thing she didn't make it into an RV because that would be even crazier. That night, I woke up to the strange sensation of my panda bus swaying side to side. When I sat up, I realized I could see that the goddess, that I could see the goddess bath through my window. Why? We will be at the camp. We should be at the campsite. I thought, wondering whether this was simply a dream. As I continued peering out the window, the spring looked entirely different from how it had during the day. Perhaps due to this being the night of flu train, the red moon, which was actually more of a dark pink upon closer inspection, was reflected in the water surface. In fact, the whole spring was shining. It wasn't just the light from the moon either. Small, round, bubble-like things of various sizes were slowly rising out of the water, shining brighter than fireflies. They burned with mysterious light as they rose out, out one after another and floated around, resulting in quite the magical sight. Wow, this is amazing. They're so sparkly, came Nicola's voice. I turned around and saw her looking out the window, too, wearing a bleary expression that made it hard to tell whether she was fully awake or still half asleep. Her sudden exclamation woke up Bridget, who leaped up and whipped out her snap in an instant before peering outside herself. After a moment's pause, she looked at me with her brow furrowed. What is the meaning of this, Lady Rosemine? The air is positively brimming with mana. I have no idea, but it's beautiful. I don't think we're any in any danger. Each shining bubble leaving the pond let in a bright, clear sound similar to a bell, and their chimes overlapped to create some very strange music. Rosina started murmuring musical skills in her sleep, then suddenly sat up and asked, Where is the harsh feel? In a sleepy tone, aimlessly groping around for the instrument. Calm down, Rosina. <laughs> She's got music on the brain. By this point, Ella and Monica were, of course, waking up as well. They all looked outside in unison and blinked in surprise. What in the world is going on? Rosina began to move her fingers restlessly through the air, overwhelmed by the music being played by the lights above a spring. Her eyes soon fell on the harsh field that was with the rest of the luggage. Well, everyone's awake now, and I can't imagine we're going to be going back to sleep anytime soon, I mused aloud. It should be fine for you to play, Rosina. I thank you ever so much, she replied, eagerly picking up the harsh field and playing music to match the sound of the bubbling spring. How has Ferdinand and the others not noticed that they're gone? Hello? The song she chose perfectly accompanied the high notes coming from the lights. Your musician truly is talented, Lady Rosemine, Bridget observed. As we all listened to Rosina's symphony with the lights, they began to gather around Leslie, floating right up to the window, oh, dang it, and trying to come inside as though they had wines of their own. Uh-oh. Monica smiled. I think the lights like your music, Rosina. Maybe you should go outside and play for them, Nicola added, giggling with Monica. The lights blinked as though indicating their agreement. Shall we offer up music then, I suggested? The goddess of spring love music, to my knowledge. They might appreciate such an offering on the night of flu train. And the goddess of this spring likes sweets, Lady Rosemine. We should offer up our remaining cookies, Nicola added. And Ella agreed with a smile. Together, ne Ella and Nicola brought out a box of sweets while Rosina climbed out with her horse feel. Bridget followed, keeping a close eye on her surroundings, leaving Monica with no choice but to join us as well. I jumped out into the clearing, feeling like I was having a nighttime picnic. It wasn't cold at all, and the spring was giving birth to even more glistening lights. 
The high-pitched reverberating chimes they made were so beautiful that just hearing them filled with me exhilaration. I peered into the shining spring and saw yet more, yet more mysterious lights rising up from its depths. That's when I noticed some tail frosts nearby flicking out their tongues to eat them. Bridget, the tail frost I caught, pointing in their direction. Bridget instantly whipped out her staff, hunting them down one by one, and the lights floating out of the water happily swarmed around Bridget as if thanking her. I looked around and saw that the floating lights had split into three groups. One stuck a Rosina and her heart's feel, another went to Ella, Nicola, and Monica with their cooking, cookies, and the three third stayed to Bridget. The lights seemed to like music as they were all flashing in time with Rosina's heart's feel. They liked my agreement of the song from my Arano day, arrangement of the song from my Arano days the most, blinking rapidly as if clapping in approval. They seem to enjoy the song that you composed, Lady Rosemine. Would you care to sing the lyrics for them? I think I will sing an entirely new song from them, I said. I didn't have my own heart spiel with me, but I could make do with just my voice. And if they liked to hear new songs, then I could just debut another from my Arano days. It was one of the spring songs, the lyrics of which I had translated into this world's language in preparation for the next time I needed Ferdinand to do something for me. I stepped in front of the spring and inhaled. Oh, God. I'm not even going to try. I began to sing, and as soon as I did, my ring started sucking up my mana on its own, relaxing, releasing it as I continued my song. You really shouldn't be wearing that dang ring around, girl, but whatever. The lights of the spring shone brighter. The entire clearing became steadily more dazzling. The stems carrying ryren flowers in the middle of the water began to stretch in size as well. Countless stems wrapping around each other as they extended upward. They grew like giant trees resting in the water, and soon the flowers began to bloom. Girl! Hello! Don't you need to get the nectar out of them when they bloom? Don't you? Oh, goddesses, might I be permitted to take some Ryra nectar, I asked once I had finished my song. A large leaf that had rested in the center of the spring opened and stretched down to rest in front of me. I stepped onto it, urged forward by the lights, at which point it grew even larger in size before slowly stretching high into the air. Uh, do you have your gathering tools with you? I hope so. Wow, I exclaimed, it had taken me right in front of a Ryren flower. Oh, she does, okay. I took the spoon from my belt of tools, just as Ferdinand had instructed, and started gathering the nectar, capping each bottle when it was full. Okay, that should do it. In fact, I think I managed to do that perfectly. Go me! A leaf was so, so high up that I could see the sun slowly rising over the horizon, gradually brightening up the night sky. The lights floated around the spring, faded, and disappeared one by one as the morning sun washed over them. Hmm? The stretched out flowers began to shrink, returning to the water's surface. The large leaf beneath my feet was no different shrink was no different, shrinking to the point that it can no longer hold my weight. Um, you need your high beast now. And then just like that, the stem snapped. Of course. Of course, of course. I might as well continue. Eep, the end of spring prayer. The leaf dropped to one side, and I soon lost my balance, slipping into the air. I could hear Bridget yell out my name from below as she summoned her high beast before she could finish. Something shot out from the trees. It charged right toward me as I spun backward, unable to focus my eyes. Then its gravity took hold, and I began falling headfirst toward the ground. It caught me. My insides dropped as I was suddenly stopped mid it, mid-fall, causing me to let out a grunt. I blinked in surprise and looked around to see what happened, only to see Ferdinand right up close, giving me a scary look for some reason. Oh, dear. His eyebrows were furrowed about 50% harder than they usually were. Ferdinand, what are you doing here? Oh, merely rescuing you from a deadly fall. Or would you rather I toss you back into the sky, he asked, glaring at me with his light golden eyes narrowed in displeasure. I hurriedly clung to him so that he couldn't drop me. My hero, thank you ever so much, I said. While well, he had saved me from the fall, I could still feel an impending sense of danger, maybe due to the lecture that I knew was inevitably coming. I trembled as Ferdinand set me down in front of my panda bus, fearing his terribly poor mood. Lady Rosemite, are you okay, Fran? Asked, rushing over with a worried look on his face. I told him I was fine, thanks to Ferdinand. The tension quickly drained from his expression as he sighed in relief. Now then, Rosemite, Ferdinand began in a low voice. I tensed up, preparing for a lecture, but all he did was ask whether I had successfully gathered the ingredient, albeit in a rather tired voice. Feeling a bit surprised by this turn of events, I nodded and showed him the bottles of uh, rye red nectar. See, I gathered it all just fine. You're welcome to shower me with compliments. Fernand took a bottle, opened it, and poured just a bit of the nectar onto his palm. He checked the color and smell, poured some mana into it, and then immediately grimaced. I expected as much, but it's already entirely di already died entirely with your mana. My own is being blocked. What? That can't be right. 
I mean, I scooped it up using the spoon just like you said to. I took out the spoon, pretty certain that I hadn't messed up the gathering process and pour pout and powered. Is it broken or something? Ferdinand shook his head. You misunderstand. The rye rain grew from your mana, and thus the flower themselves were dyed. Uh, maybe did I maybe mess up? I asked, feeling bad for Ferdinand and everyone else who had gone on this journey with us. Had I managed to ruin everything after we went out of our way to defeat the Tau Frost and ask the gods to themselves for the nectar? Ferdinand shook his head again while magically cleaning the nectar from his hand. No, you did not fail. Our per primary goal was gathering your ingredient, and that was accomplished. However, he trailed off and went out of sight. In any case, we must return to the font Fontadorf Winter Mansion post-haste. It wasn't just Ferdinand who looked tired. Fran, Eckert, and Daniel, all the men in our group, looked exhausted for some reason. Their faces were pale, and they were sighing as if weary to the bone. Did something happen? Too much for me to explain here. We shall discuss the bizarre behavior of the forest in spring tomorrow. The sooner we return and rest, the better. Now, none of you got much sleep last night, I would expect. Ferdinand cut the conversation short, saying that he'd give the details tomorrow, but their night had apparently been pretty crazy thanks to the forest, too. I took them ahead curiously, then called out to stop the men from packing. Actually, would you care to wait a moment? I would like to gather some water from the spring before we leave. It's good for curing light wounds and sicknesses, correct? It would be nice to have for those who, for when those in the orphanage get sick, and I'm sure that Fontador's mayor would appreciate receiving some as well. Do as you wish. Luckily, we had several barrels of water inside Leslie to use on our journey. Each was big enough to carry several liters, and two were already empty as a result of us eating, all eating and Bridget and me washing ourselves down. My attendants thus scooped water for the spring and into the barrels. We can refill our drinking water here as well. After filling our drinking pouches with spring water as well, we returned to Fontador's winter mansion. The men were exhausted, of course, and while we girls had all undoubtedly had fun last night, we were definitely sleep-deprived too. While stifling yawns and rubbing our eyes as we decided to get to bed early and rest well. After I had bathed and refreshed myself, Ferdinand came to me with a recovery potion. Rose, my drink this before you sleep, he said, and after drinking it, I climbed into bed. So, what crazy things happened to you two boys last night, I asked the next morning after breakfast, brimming with excitement as I sipped my tea. Ferdinand, Eckert, and Daniel, on the other hand, all grimaced simultaneously. It seemed the night had not been as an enjoyable one for them. To put matters simply, the goddess harassed us. What? She harassed you? As it turned out, while we girls had been playing with the mysterious lights during the night of flu train, the men had been having a very bad time. Do you recall, Rosemine, how we took turns keeping watch throughout the night? Eckert asked. I nodded. Bridget, Eckert, Ferdinand, and Daniel had tasked, taken turns staying up and keeping watch, each of them having experience doing so from their training. The incident in question had apparently occurred during Ferdinand's watch. The trees began to abruptly sway without warning. At first, I thought it might simply be the wind, but there was not even a breeze. The trees were swaying on their own, Ferdinand explained. I scanned the area on guard when suddenly the trees moved as though they had minds of their own, grasping your high beast with their branches and passing it down from trees. That would explain why they were at the spring. Okay, that makes sense. My jaw dropped as I imagined how it must have looked for Leslie to be passed between the trees like a baton in a relay race. I would understand if you did not believe me. I myself doubted my own two eyes. After all, what am I referring to here is the trees themselves working together to move your high beast. It was unthinkable. As soon as Ferdinand saw Leslie being passed down the trees, he immediately woke everyone else up and began attacking the trees to get us back. But since they couldn't risk hitting us, they couldn't launch any direct attacks. Instead, they ended up chasing after us in our high beasts. I'm glad we didn't get hit with the full force of your attacks, I said, looking as particular at Ferdinand and Eckert. The trees had moved to block their path, putting distance between us as Ferdinand and the others worked to cut them down. By the time they were able to get through, Leslie had already been brought to the goddess's bath, and while they had somehow managed to chop their way to the spring, they ultimately been stopped by a thick wall of mana that blocked their entry. It was warm in the spring and there was not any snow, correct? That was due to the mana filling the area. We had all noticed it while hunting the town frost, but I never expected that enough strong mana would accumulate to prevent us all from entering, Ferdinand said with a bitter expression. He possessed so much mana that he had undoubtedly grown accustomed to smashing through almost any barrier in his way. He had been put in a frustrating situation where he could see Leslie by the spring but couldn't actually approach us. When the lights began to gather around my panda bus, he broke out in a cold sweat, and when we just outright stepped out of our own accord, he had apparently shouted, You fools on instinct! We sure didn't hear that. <laughs> it brought that sound, too. In any case, I ask that you never again thoughtlessly wander out into an area dominated by such an immense amount of mana. It is beyond dangerous, Ferdinand said. You are only safe, but you will remain inside your own high base, which is filled with your own mana. 
I was told that it was dangerous to go outside before identifying whether the one wielding the mana was friend or foe. The lights didn't seem hostile at all. Even creatures that do not appear to possess hostility can change on a whim, if you displease them, and in such cases, it is impossible to say what might happen. Oh, that's very true. It seemed that even Fran, Daniel, and Eckhart had gotten stress-induced headaches as they watched us from the other side of the mana wall. No matter how much they called out, none of us heard them. None of us could hear them. And while they were having borderline heart attacks, my musicians started playing the heart spiel and my chef spread out snacks like a picnic. If you had the presence of mind to peer into the spring and had the towel frosts, you should have been able to notice that we were not there, Ferdinand said with a glare. Bridget and I exchanged looks. When he put it like that, it was really weird that we hadn't noticed they were missing. It was strange, but at the time, they weren't on our minds at all. Maybe the spring was so breathtakingly mystical that we all came to see it as a dream world, I suggested. While I was in the high base, I thought that I must send word at once, but the instant I stepped outside, all such thoughts left me. I was no longer capable of comprehending that we were missing people, Bridget replied. It seemed that she had visit had exited Leslie with a face stone in hand, intending to send an order on, but upon sent stepping out, she immediately forgot why she was holding a face stone at all. Wow. So it made y'all forget things. <sighs> The mana must have been exerting its influence, Ferdinand muttered, pressing a hand against his forehead. And then you faced the spring and you started singing. Your mana spread and the flowers began to grow. Can you imagine how much panic we felt at that moment? It seemed that they had been extremely uneasy as they watched me leisurely continuing to sing despite the flowers growing around us. They started to worry whether I would be able to harvest the rye red nectar at all. Eckert shook his head equally exasperated. What really shocked me was that you stood on the leaf to gather the nectar. No normal person would stand on such unreliable footing as a leaf, Fernand continued. What did I give you a high beast? Why did they exist? Consider these questions carefully. I clapped my hands together in realization. Of course, had I gathered the nectar while on my high beast, I would have been completely safe, even after the morning sun shrank the leaves. Normal people certainly aren't wise, aren't they, I said. No, you are simply a fool. They had almost keeled over in agonizing stress as I stepped onto the leaf and casually gathered the nectar, despite my footing being so fragile that even a calm breeze might knock me off. We watched on, terrified of your inevitable fall, until the monowall started to fade along with the brightening of the sky. The light of the morning sun had evaporated the balls of light, and as they disappeared, the spring returned to its usual appearance. But even as everything went back to normal, including the shrinking leaf beneath my feet, I just kept looking at the sky in a daze. It had been so terrifying that Fran actually let out a yell. I brought forth my high beast, hunt burst through the thin wall, mountain wall, and began to race through the sky when, as expected, the stem of the leaf snapped. Ferdinand said it was thanks to him acting so soon that he had managed to catch me right as I started falling through the, sky, through the air. When you put it that way, I sure was in a lot of danger, wasn't I? Thank you for helping me once again, Ferdinand. I am so grateful that I wish I could make you a stress alleviation potion. I would never drink something as dangerous. Your gratitude is enough, though. I must ask that you stop blindly walking into danger time and time again. I'll try to do better. As you should. In any case, you knew what happened from there. I really didn't expect that you all had such a hard time, I said with a sigh. We girls were having the time of our lives in the dream like fantasy spring. and never had it even crossed my mind that the men were watching over in, stress in stressful agony. Why wouldn't the mana wall that men in? Fran offered up sweets to the shrine too. Perhaps the goddess of the spring is not fond of men. It is known as the goddess's bath, after all. It could be that no men are allowed in during the night of flu train, Bridget suggested. I mean, if it's known as the goddess's bath, then wouldn't it make sense that you wouldn't want men watching women taking baths? Especially goddesses? So of course not. But ultimately, we didn't understand what had separated our two groups. Perhaps the goddess had just been after the sweets and Leslie. We came up with a bunch of possible theories, but in the end, there was no way for anyone to know which was the right one. In any case, we had gathered the rye rind nectar and completed our objective here. We shall return to our spring prayer duties starting tomorrow. Right. With my spring gathering now complete as well, we would be leaving Flu Fontadorf and returning to spring prayer, but before we left, we gave the mayor some of the spring water as planned. Thank you for your hospitality. As a token of my appreciation, I offer to you water from the spring. Please use it if someone falls sick or home becomes injured. You have my utmost gratitude, the mayor responded. I expect that it will be significantly more effective than the usual spring water, Ferdinand added. It has been drawn by the blessed saint of Arenfest, after all. The mayor gasped in surprise, looking between me and the sealed barrel full of water. Truly, to think that you would gift us such valuable water. Fernand, I explained, glaring at him. But he simply murmured for me to leave it be, since he would apparently be inconvenient in more ways than one for others. To learn the spring's mana intensified at this time of year. In his attempt to hide it, Ferdinand had made the water out to be precious holy water that was to be used sparingly. 
having been personally drawn from the spring by the Saint of Arambest. Well, as long as they get a lot of use out of it, I guess it's fine. Several days after we had safely finished spring prayer and returned to the temple, Ferdinand summoned me over, seeming more excited than usual. Is there something we need to discuss? I'd rather be preparing for my meeting with the Gilberta Company later today. Silence, just follow me. Ferdinand all but dragged me into his in-room, which he had fashioned into a workshop to discuss the rye rye nectar we had gathered. He went through his explanation quickly out of excitement, but it contained so much technical terminology that I didn't actually understand what he was going on about. I'm sorry, but could you repeat that with a little less jargon? Or better yet, give me a book that will teach me said jargon. I'll read it right here and now, I promise. Unfortunately, he elected to simplify his explanation instead. To sum it up, the rye rye nectar was which of my mana, but it hadn't been entirely dyed by it. What did that mean exactly? I have no idea. This nectar crystallizes when completely filled with mana. You will need to crystallize a portion to use in your potion like so. Fernand said using his own mana to demonstrate, the nectar formed into, morphed into a gray face stone like crystal, which he showed me before handing me a bottle of the nectar. I poured my mana into it while Ferdinand continued his explanation. The nectar has much of your mana within it due to coming from a flower that you personally matured. It is a material exceedingly rich with pure water. But since it's dyed of my mana, nobody else can use it, right? That would normally be the case, but it seems this rye rye nectar in particular can be dyed with another's mana. One must overcome much resistance to do so, but it is very much worth it, Ferdinand said amusedly while rolling the green crystal around on his palm. I am quite interested in learning whether this is possible only with nectar harvested on the night of flu train, or if it is possible with other ingredients as well. Rosemary, would you care to grow various fey plants with me to experiment? As much as I love the idea of growing fey plants with Ferdinand's explicit permission and using the research to help with paper making, there was one thing that gave me pause. I don't mind growing fey plants since I could also use them to help develop paper, but does Aaron Fest have enough leeway when it comes to mana that we can spare so much of mine on experiments and growing play plants, I asked, keeping it to myself that I had already been stealthily growing trombas. Oh, yeah, you don't need to know that. <laughs> yeah, because if he knew that, he would freak out because he's supposed to kill those things. Ferdinand wired his eyes and shook his head, his brow thoroughly knit atop a bitter expression. It does not. I thought as much. Our grand fey plant cultivation plan thus came to a swift end, but Ferdinand wasn't quick to give up on it. In ten years, then, Rosemont, shall we experiment once the duchy has more leeway and you've grown such that you have more mana? I didn't know whether it was due to the key, new ingredient or him having developed a new magical theory, but Ferdinand was seriously motivated. He was even willing to plan ten whole years ahead for this. I'll have you know that my mana is expensive, I said with a grin, at which point Ferdinand gave a dismissive laugh. What are your demands? I can prepare more money than you will know what to do with. Ferdinand, do you really think that I would ask for money here, I asked, broadening my grin. Ferdinand narrowed his eyes, raising his guard a little, but the fact he raised his guard instead of giving up entirely showed that he really did need my mana for his experiments. And if my mana was that viable to him, then I could drive as hard of a bargain as I wanted. If you want my mana, you'll have to give me a library. I can wait ten years. Have fun! Ferdinand furrowed his brow harder, but he avoided giving a clear answer. The epilogue! However, that's going to have to wait. I will see you all in the next one.